the icons of communism tumble down across Eastern Europe, one of the few monuments to Marxism in Britain is being exhumed. Painted by the only English protege of the great Mexican muralist Diego Rivera, the Marxist fresco has been buried behind a wall of books for more than 40 years. The Marx Memorial Library in Clerkenwell Green, the spiritual home of British socialism since the 18th century, commissioned the mural in 1935 from Viscount Hastings, son of the 14th Earl of Huntingdon. Jack Hastings, a descendant of Robin Hood, was born in 1902. Well, his background was pretty conventional. Uh, his class, uh, he went to Eton and he went to Oxford and he played polo for Oxford and he did all the accepted things. Uh, they lived in a reasonably, reasonably large house in the country and I suppose he went into all the normal sporting pursuits. And he was always wanting to paint. He always had it in his blood, you know, to, to paint. He had a great feeling for visual art. And incidentally, for, uh, uh, for music as well. He was a very good uh, player of various musical instruments. And so he had a, a tremendous artistic bent. After Oxford, Hastings married Christina Cassati, daughter of the notorious Marchese Cassati, one of the most extravagant and eccentric hostesses of the era. Hastings' parents disapproved of his marrying a Catholic and a foreigner, so he ran away with his bride to the island of Morea in the South Seas, where they lived in a house called the House of Dreams. Christina was the sort of person who appealed to his uh, wanting something different, wanting something away from convention, wanting a person who didn't have a normal English background, because I think that sort of bored him. And so they got on very well indeed for a time. In the South Seas, Hastings met and befriended the pioneering filmmaker Robert Flaherty, whose production Taboo had run out of money. Hastings set up a company to finance completion of the film. He started to paint seriously, and by 1930, was anxious to join the artistic mainstream. Jack and Christina Hastings were sailing back on their boat from the South Sea, heading for Mexico, where Hastings had decided he wanted to apprentice himself to Diego Rivera in order to learn about fresco technique. Um, when they stopped off in San Francisco, they found that by lucky coincidence, Rivera was already in San Francisco. Diego Rivera had come to the United States to paint murals which celebrated the new industrial age. A founder of the Mexican mural renaissance in the 1920s, he was one of the great political artists of the century. His revolutionary images of Mexican history decorate the walls of public buildings throughout Mexico. In San Francisco, Rivera took on Jack Hastings as his chief assistant. Their first collaboration was the Allegory of California for the Pacific Stock Exchange. I think he sparked off in the direction of left-wing politics by his association with Diego Rivera, who he was thought was enormously powerful, and arresting, and miraculous man. And uh, he, of course, Diego Rivera was somewhat of a revolutionary and uh, this uh, interested Jack, and uh, he accepted uh, the general left-wing view of the time, that capitalism was a washout, and it would cause a great many people to starve of meeting, and everybody was getting a rotten deal. He thought this was very unreasonable, but it's perfectly true, it is very unreasonable. And uh, so he became very left-wing. Rivera's whole move towards muralism had come out of his political intentions rather than being primarily a muralist. It wasn't that he happened to be a mural painter and a socialist. It was because he was a socialist and a painter 
that he felt that neuralism was the most appropriate form. I think with Hastings, it was more that the, the whole sort of glamour attached with the Mexican neural movement and with the excitement generated by that particular moment in history in the 1920s really appealed to him as, as an Englishman, as a foreigner. The exoticism and um, the, uh, the, the sort of almost like the radical chic of what Rivera was doing, I think, appealed. Rivera's other collaborator in San Francisco was the British sculptor Clifford White. Hastings and White were more than just Rivera's assistant. They also, with their wives, Christina Hastings and Jean White, they socialized quite a lot with Rivera and his wife, Frida Kahlo. They also formed the subject of, of each other's work. There's a painting from the San Francisco period of Jean White by Frida Kahlo and White and Hastings figure in Rivera's mural in the Art Institute there. Um, as a group of three couples, they did quite a lot together, and there were various intrigues uh, emerging from this, what obviously became a fairly incestuous relationship over this two-year period when they were working together. After San Francisco, Rivera was commissioned by the Ford family to paint a mural on the theme of Detroit industry at the city's Institute of Arts. He took Hastings and White as his assistants. The three couples stayed at the Wardell Hotel, and relationships became increasingly intriguing. The Whites received this envelope from Frida Kahlo. In answer to Mrs. White. It contained this sheet of drawings. Hastings and White continued plastering, transferring drawings to the walls, and mixing paints in Detroit. Until the Chicago World's Fair invited Hastings to paint a mural, illustrating the history of dentistry around a public display of George Washington's false teeth. In March 1933, Rivera went to New York to paint a mural for J.D. Rockefeller's new Radio City building to be called Man at the Crossroads, looking with hope and high vision to a new and better future. In April, Frida Kahlo wrote to Clifford White. Diego is working like hell and half the big wall is already finished. It is wonderful and he is very happy. I am too. We saw Nelson Rockefeller and his wife. Nelson sends his regards to you. It was at that point a very prestigious commission that he'd been given. It had been offered to both Picasso and Matisse, but in the end it was Rivera who got the commission. Um, but after discovering that Rivera was including in his image of a uh, man at the crossroads, a portrait head of Lenin, very prominently placed on one side of the mural, Rockefeller had the whole mural uh, sealed off and refused access to the artist to the site. Um, the mural was covered in canvas um, in May of 1933 until in the spring of 1934 they came in with pneumatic drills and broke the mural from the wall. It is a pity that you were not here in New York while all the Rockefeller business happened. I have learned so many things here and am more and more convinced that the only way to be a man, I mean a human being and not an animal, is to be a communist. Are you laughing at me? Please don't, because it is absolutely true. In defiance, Rivera returned to Mexico and repainted Man at the Crossroads in the National Art Gallery, adding a more explicit political message. On 
On Hastings' return to England, he was commissioned to paint the first true fresco in Britain for 400 years. With Clifford White as his assistant, he embarked on an interpretation of Marxism for the newly founded Marx Memorial Library and Workers' School. In 1933, which was the 50th anniversary of the death of Karl Marx, a group of progressive people came together, corporate as trade unionists and others, to decide a fitting memorial. Um, at that time, 1933, Hitler had just come to power and books were being burned in Germany. And it was decided that providing a library of books would be the most apt memorial to Karl Marx. The library also houses a shrine to the man who put Marxist theory into practice. In 1902, during his exile from Russia, Lenin worked in this tiny office, editing Iskra, the organ that sparked the Russian Revolution. The fact that the Lenin room is here adds a quality and a reason for being in this building that you don't find elsewhere, the actual study <coughs> that Lenin worked in. Elsewhere, in, say, for in Switzerland, that Lenin's been associated with, they've all sanitized it. You'd never know anybody ever sat in the room, let alone... Uh, somebody who's fought and wrote it off. Since its inception, the library has depended on voluntary labour to keep it going. I was born in, as a socialist. I, my, my parents are both anarchists, actually. But I was raised in labour movement, and uh, it is my whole life, basically. I think libraries are very important. We are a unique library, you see. There's nothing else quite like us in this country. If we had more money, it would be much better, but we haven't got it, so we do what we can. But it's a sort of a... A life project for me. I'm here. I'll be here today I die, actually. But there's two basic rules that I impose on the volunteers, which seem rather harsh, I agree. The first one is that there's no reading the books, and the second is that there's no talking politics while they're here. I volunteer for the library to bring the works of Marx and his... Dis and his uh, disciples, I suppose, is the appropriate word, to the wider world in what he actually said, not all the travesties that we have had over the years. And might I make the point, whatever else has happened over the recent months, Marxism is not dead, and eventually it will succeed. The vaults and corridors of the library are overflowing with the revolutionary literature of the past. In 1949, Hastings' fresco was lost behind a wall of 20th century political theory. The mural was covered up in the late 40s when the emphasis of the library changed from the work of school to the library and the, the books were brought upstairs and Basically, they ran out of shelf space and had to cover the mural to accommodate all the books. It's very ironic, in a sense, that uh, after the enormous scandal of the uh, right-wing establishment attacking the cause of artistic freedom in the destruction of the Rockefeller Center, what you have with Rivera's assistant, Hastings, when he comes back to England to decorate the walls of what one would assume would have been a fairly safe location, the Marx Memorial Library, that, that too suffered a similar to fate. We're very conscious at the moment of the history of this building with the 20th century press going right back even to the 12th century. It has associations and I feel it very appropriate that this mural should be exposed. Conjecture, 
I remember when I was told about this mural and I came to see it, there was books in front of it, nice screens. And here we go again, the visual illiterates covering up uh, paintings with books. Books have always been considered sort of sacrosanct by socialists and communists and Marxists. And these visual icons to that period are considered sort of secondary. Amongst large sections of the left, there is a workerist attitude that conceives of all sorts of cultural activity as being wet, as being namby-pamby. It's not about bread and butter issues. They forget that socialism has always fought for bread and roses. Well, I think it's rather a bad work of art, I have to say. But it does give me a kind of feeling of sadness, actually. I didn't expect that that would be my reaction. But with these kind of soft, sort of rather faded colours, it, it sort of gives me this feeling of a kind of rather faded vision of what, you know, British Marxism felt it was. And it's very, to us, a uh, very oversimplified view of the sort of revolutionary process and what would happen after the revolution. I feel that we're now looking at this image over a great kind of distance, you know, almost over a historical abyss, really. We're staring into the past. Um, uh, the picture itself is depicting a past, but now it's our past, it's become our past. And we're looking at a, a, a very classical image or record of the interpretation of socialism of a previous age. Uh, a lot has happened between the 30s and the 90s, and it's therefore impossible not to look at this critically. I think the 30s were, uh, in some ways, a fairly bleak period for socialist art. This is painted just after the notorious promulgation of the doctrine of socialist realism at a Soviet Congress. The philosophy of socialist realism, derived from Stalin's description of artists and writers as the engineers of human souls, its objective was to depict the heroic ideals of socialism with optimism and enthusiasm. It persisted as the official art of the socialist bloc for over half a century. The Soviet people are extremely fond of painting, graphic art, and sculpture. The Soviet fine art is rooted in the struggle for ideological purity, and it has developed on the principles of socialist realism and a profound study of life. Lenin and Stalin give inspiration to the creative efforts of Soviet artists. The warm friendship between these two great men is reflected in the canvas by Pyotr Vasilyev. Long live the Socialist Revolution. This canvas by the artist Serov shows... Socialist realism has become a sort of joke, really. It's something you can't possibly approve of, you know. Um, in a way, I think one has to look at it and say its aspirations were quite valid. You know, it was all about optimism. But I personally don't believe it can ever be the form of art. There can never be one form of art which is a politically correct answer to problems of aesthetics and representation and so on. And I believe that, uh, you know, one of the great failures of the Russian Revolution, of the, of the Soviet, of Soviet society, was that it sort of destroyed experimentation in art and was so suspicious um, of experimentation. I might have sat to all kinds of bloody awful art, and bad art in the name of, you know, I mean, like the Red Army Choir, I mean, sit and watch the thingy roll out the barrel, I mean, kitsch crap, you know, but we had to go and see them every year when they came to town, you know. You know bloody awful, you know. Bloody awful Bolshoi Ballet. Bloody awful Moscow Circus with the bloody awful clowns. I mean, <laughs> I've seen anything worse in Moscow Circus. There was an idea current in the 30s and right up to today that artists should reject what was considered to be bourgeois canvases and go out and start painting on walls. Agitational works, works which they felt sort of epitomised the struggle for socialism and murals was one aspect of that. One of the things about Rivera's work, which is particularly interesting, is the way in which he uses history uh, as 
to present a series of juxtapositions, almost trying to sort of produce visually some kind of dialectical image of the past. Whereas in this mural, you're presented with this almost like a kind of one-off moment, dealing with just a very one-dimensional notion of revolution, giving you no understanding of why the revolution will happen, what processes will lead towards that revolution, and what will happen because of that revolution. I think the mural can be regarded as a valid interpretation of Marxism, because when you look at it and you think of the date at which it was, uh, uh, at which it was painted, the first thing that strikes you is the absence uh, of uh, Stalin. And that is really quite remarkable uh, for that year. The reason can only be that Hastings himself was influenced by the politics of uh, Diego Rivera, and in particular uh, by what undoubtedly must have been the anti-Stalinist ideas that uh, uh, Diego Rivera was uh, uh, developing after his expulsion from the Communist Party. Rivera's alienation from Stalinism culminated in his persuading the Mexican government to give asylum to Leon Trotsky, Stalin's arch-enemy. And so when Hastings came back and painted this particular mural, he excluded Stalin. And that I find the most remarkable thing, because Stalin in 1935 was, of course, the dominating figure in the international communist movement, and it is very striking that uh, he is not to be found. By the mid-1930s, Stalinism had permeated the iconography and the politics of British communism. The problem for socialists in Britain, I think, is that they've accepted uncritically a Soviet model and tried to impose it in an alien way on a culture which, for which it was completely unsuitable. So I think the idea of going back to the roots of um, William Morris and the Chartists and so on is very important in the development of the British uh, vision of socialism. Robert Owen was the father of English socialism and William Morris was the outstanding creative Marxist of the whole of the English tradition. What Hastings was doing, in other words, was putting together um, a picture of uh, the development of English socialism from Robert Owen through Morris, or uh, in the later period being influenced by Marx himself. To me it's quite a disturbing picture in a way because um, the people are very low down, very tiny figures scattering here and there, piled here and there. Uh, you've got a slightly larger uh, sized um, chartist movement, labor movement and so on here. But of course, dominating the whole scene is this great pantheon of great men. Now, that's, I think, one of the worst aspects of that uh, period, of that socialist aesthetic. That you were really not breaking with uh, class art in the sense you were still thinking of great mythological individual figures. kind of replacement of um, conventional deities with the new deities, you know, of uh, Marx and uh, Lenin and Robert Owen, some of the people with beards. And uh, there's also one of the things that's always seemed to be particularly foolish about kind of the kind of socialism of my parents, communism that my parents are certainly involved in and I was involved in. So it's always this kind of assertion that, that, that the kind of, you know, workers' paradise is inevitable. It's going to come, comrades, you know, the strike, we will be victorious. Whereas I always thought people should say, you know, when they're making speeches like during the line, say, look, look we've, got, we've got a big problem here. You know, the chances are we're going to get completely knackered, but we've got to do it anyway. You know, that kind of foolish kind of optimism, you know, that, I mean, it's not at all inevitable that, you know, socialism or whatever, despite what Marx said, you know, it's highly unlikely. I mean, never, it doesn't mean that you should necessarily not fight for it, but, I mean, to, to go around thinking, well, you know, we don't have to do anything. If it's inevitable, we might as well just <laughs> sit and wait. What happens is that uh, you have this idea that a, a wonderful society is coming, you know, that 
that society itself isn't seen in terms of change. Once you get there, nothing will ever change again, and you will stop history. And all these human problems like crime and so on will, not just poverty, but kind of crime and unhappy marriages will all be stopped. And I think that's never going to happen. There will always be struggles, and there will always be a process going on. Um, and one of the problems, that's one of the problems about socialist realism, that it really kind of is the painting of that idea that we will actually reach a perfect society which doesn't need to change anymore. This is painted not long after the destruction of Rivera's Man at the Crossroads. Um, and there, there are interesting parallels, both of them um, structure their composition around a central figure of the worker. In Rivera's mural, however, the, the worker is choosing between the disparate ideologies of the left and the right, whereas in Hastings' mural, uh, the worker is um, rising up from his uh, imprisonment to overthrow the existing order. Well, the hero is obviously very strong. I think he's meant to be modelled on a Welsh miner or something like that. But he's rather there as the sort of mindless brute of the picture, I think, uh, with these wise men who are all men, um, sort of looking on and guiding him. I think it's rather patronising in that sense. And there's also the kind of romantic deification of the kind of dopey working class, really. You know, all this is like he's he's who it's being done for, but he's obviously a bit thick, really, isn't he? The poor love. He needs really, he needs looking after. He needs telling what's best for him by this by the central committee, you know, he can't make... He's like the sort of, like the cart horse in Animal Farm, you know. He looks like a sort of boyfriend of W.H. Auden or something, doesn't he? You, know, you can imagine him going to the Café de Paris with Christopher Isherwood or some sort of, you know. I must say, I've never thought of the central figure as homoerotic, so once you see, you, you've heard that, it becomes incredibly obvious. Um, I'm sure it wasn't, in well, I, I imagine it wasn't intentional. Um, but I suppose it's all part of this kind of um, overvaluation of masculinity. So although there are a lot of women and they're playing their role, um, somehow there is a kind of glorification of masculine power or male power. I think that uh, it could be a sort of romantic picture of the working class painted by somebody who didn't actually have much experience himself of suffering or toiling of any kind. He loved painting. Uh, I think he could have painted much more if he hadn't had a, a mildly idle streak. But he had a great sense of humour. And of course I think you'll notice that in almost anything he paints, including the uh, mural of Got Hair, there's a good deal of humour in it, isn't there? And, uh, and uh, he was always laughing about. He, uh, he was never uh, he was never obsessed with uh, politics. He was never obsessed with having believed in something to the exclusion of being amused. Hastings continued to paint frescoes after Mark's house, mainly in the stately homes of his friends and relatives, but never again with such strong political content. In 1939, he succeeded his father as Earl of Huntingdon. Four years later, he divorced Christina and married Margaret Lane the writer and biographer of Beatrix Potter. His politics shifted to the right. He was a member of the Labour government in 1945. Uh, he was an under-secretary of the Ministry of Agriculture. And he enjoyed it for a bit, you know, for five years. And I think he got rather bored with it, because he was rather peevish. You know, uh, and he wasn't very excited, particularly the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, he, but he went on feeling uh, sympathetic and for Labour. I think he would have done very well if we had a few more colonies left and uh, Ireland and so on. He could have been a very satisfactory governor. After all, he had the bearing for it. He had the, this wonderful courtesy and dignity. And uh, of course, he was descended from uh, Duke of Clarence. And uh, if you took the throne as passing properly, by accurate eldest son and so forth, he would, he would have been the King of England. Jack Hastings continued painting into old age. He died in August 1990, 
as world events seemed to signify the ultimate failure of the ideology he'd embraced as a young man. I think that um, Marxism was abused over the last 40 years and that far from being seen as something on which people should draw and apply to their own society and think for themselves, it was used as a dogma and as something which gave you the answers before you even looked at the problem. And I think it actually became a hindrance to the development of the socialist movement in Britain as a result. But having said that, I don't want to see us rejecting the, all that work, all that theory. And I think there's a great deal in what Marx wrote about exploitation, about understanding class conflict, uh, which can be used in a creative way. It's a stuffy thing to say, but I still consider myself to be a Marxist, because I mean, Marxist uh, <coughs> analysis of history seems relatively, relatively accurate, relatively spot on. I mean, where Marxism falls down, or Marxism-Leninism falls down, is its attempt to predict the future, you know, or to assert what the future was going to be, really. Um, we, I mean, it's hard enough to predict the horse race, you know what I mean? As far as which of these figures will survive, I think, I hope, it will be Karl Marx himself, um, which is perhaps an unusual thing to say in a period when, for a lot of people, Marxism is discredited or dead. Um, whatever it was that collapsed uh, over the past couple of years in Eastern Europe, it sure doesn't seem to me to be Marxism. Um, it's, it was... Uh, something associated with a, with a face not here, perhaps significantly, on this mural, which was that of Joseph Stalin. Um, so I think that uh, although Marxism is under assault in many ways in the West and seems to have been discredited in many ways in the East, um, uh, its obituary notices have been prematurely issued. People are prophesying the end, the death of Marxism, all that sort of thing. Uh, People are also asking, you know, what is this Marxism? What's happened? Why has it gone wrong? Is there much in it still? Perhaps we read about it. And I say that the, the decay of in Eastern Europe has somehow precipitated the interest in Marxism. It may not interest precipitate the growth of it, but the interest in it, and people will read about it. The function here is very much to be a living library. We don't want to become a museum or just an archive. We've hidden the, our light under a bushel here for many, many years. So I see my function and the future here is to make it more widely known, more accessible. This place, I mean, is, is redolent of that sort of... I mean, it, it, it reminds me of a lot of buildings and stuff that I went to with my parents. I mean, it should be. It's commie world, really, isn't it? You know what I mean? I mean, it should be like a kind of... a Disneyland for Marxists, you know? I mean, you could run it as a kind of theme park of sort of vanished political cultures. I mean, you could have Lenin and his big fiberglass eggs going. pleasure to welcome you to the Marx Memorial Library on the occasion of the unveiling of this magnificent mural. Viscount Hastings, Earl of Huntingdon, descendant from the Plantagenet throne, perhaps reflected more towards his association with Robin Hood when conceiving this mural. <laughs> At a time when there has been increased interest in Marxism and in the use of the library, we are particularly pleased that the mural has been exposed and restored, and it fills me with pride and pleasure 